so appreciate the prayer that that song represents. And there, there's just times where scripture jumps out to us as completely relevant, and it never ceases to amaze me when I stop and think the scripture that we're reading in front of us is at least 2,000 years old, as is the case with the passage we're in today from Romans chapter 12. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 12, we're going to start there. Um, And that's true with that passage of scripture for sure. Um, But it's amazing how it just jumps out as completely relevant. To quote Martin Luther, uh, the great reformer, he said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. Can you identify? As we open up to Romans, we're finishing our series on resolving conflict and the natural problems that we tend to have in just plain getting along with each other while we're here and now on this planet. Well, good thing all of our conflicts are resolved now, right? (laughs) Good thing there's no more disagreement in the world to divide us or to create problems. It's so good that we have the scripture to speak into our condition. You know, one day by and by, all of our conflicts will ultimately be solved when Jesus Christ returns and sets everything right side up, right? There's, there's our hope. That's our eternal hope. But in the meantime, God wants us to grow in character through our conflicts. In this way, do you know that every conflict that you have in your life right now is an opportunity? It's an opportunity to grow And it's an opportunity to give glory to God, depending upon the way we manage or work through our differences and our difficulties. Well, the book of Romans, particularly chapters 12 through 15, read like a conflict manual. I want to invite you to read Romans 12 through 15 that way sometime, and even to consider the preface of Romans 1 through 11, about how God has sent his son into this world to bring peace between rebellious humanity and a holy and righteous God. There's wonderful theology there, Romans 1 through 11. And then there's this big therefore, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, and the rest of it follows as really practical stuff. Therefore, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Be willing to die to yourself and your own desires and and selfishness and need to always have your way. Be willing to die to sin and live for Jesus Christ. If you read through 12 through 15, you'll notice something. There was conflict in the church at Rome 2,000 years ago. I know this surprises no one, but there was. The issues are different, but the principles and God's word to us still stands. Paul's counsel to them is very applicable to the things that divide us here and now. In their situation, the church was dividing over what people ate and what people drank. There were two factions within the church, two groups of people. One group of people were the Jewish Christians by background. They were Christians, but they were taught in the Torah. They were taught with the law. And so they knew about clean and unclean things that we ate. And in their society, in their culture, they were subservient to the Romans at this time. Everybody was in the known world then. There were those who were not Christians who were sacrificing to idols. And once they sacrificed meat or wine to idols, well, what were they going to do with it? Because the idols obviously didn't consume it. And so naturally, they mixed it in with the rest of the meat that they sold at the market and the rest of the wine that they sold in the market. They got a double use out of the wine and out of the meat that was sacrificed to these gods. For those of Jewish descent and Jewish background, this thought that they could be eating meat that may have been sacrificed to an idol or they could be drinking wine that may have been sacrificed to an idol, for them made those unclean. Now, the other group in the church, obviously, are those who were not raised with Jewish background, but who have come to believe in Christ. They, it would seem from reading Romans, had no problem with discount meat. 
bring it on. Paul actually gives his opinion about whether or not the meat is clean or unclean. You probably know what he says. He doesn't believe that there's really a difference. But he introduces to us this concept of debatable issues or matters that really don't matter, if you will. And his counsel to us is very clear that we ought to think Christianly about the things that divide us and consider a bigger perspective. I want to invite you to stand with me as you're able. And in a way, what I want to offer are these thoughts on agreeing to disagree and debatable topics. Today, it's more of a, how about we prevent some conflict, not just learn how to walk through it. <laughs> how about we do that? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Well, fitting for Valentine's Day, love. And love, as we've said all along through this series, needs to be our motivation in peacemaking. Amen? It, it isn't about us. It isn't about looking good. It's really about love. Do we love each other? Love must be sincere, Paul writes. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Could we say this? We know that he's writing to people in conflict. Could we even say this in conflict? Be joyful and hopeful. Be patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. It's all over in these few chapters of Romans to get along with each other. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Now that sounds very flowery. Love must be sincere. This is love. And now here's love under conflict. If you just fast forward to Romans 14 and verse 13 now. Romans 14, 13, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed, because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not, by eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good to be spoken of as evil. This is great. For the kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and a mutual edification or building up. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Oh, Paul gives his opinion. All food is clean. I think some of them probably didn't like that. They knew Paul was from a Jewish background, though. He really has authority to say this. All food is clean, but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. Pretty amazing advice coming here. Are we ready for it? So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. I almost wonder if Paul was a little bit frustrated reading all of his social media when he wrote that. I'm not sure, <laughs> but there it is. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Amen? Please be seated. And, and, and it is my prayer that God would change us through his word. The things that the Roman Christians were dealing with back in the day, they really are the same things that we're dealing with in our day because human nature has not changed and we certainly, in our sophistication and advancements, uh, in our mass communications, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we have not outgrown the need to love each other. Wouldn't you agree? 
I mean, Paul points to this as, he points to this as the remedy for all of it. He doesn't say that we have to agree on these things. Do you notice? And he does point out that, that for all sides and all parties on all sides of all conflicts and arguments, that our goal needs to be to build each other up and not to consider our own needs as the primary factor, but the needs of others. Have you ever noticed it's just so easy to get wrapped up in an argument that we forget to take on the mindset of a servant? I remember hearing marriage advice one time that said, Ken, well, I'm sure the speaker said Ken. That's what I heard. Ken, you can be right. You can win an argument, and you can be the loser at the same time. Has anyone else discovered this in marriage? <laughs> we sometimes insist that everyone else understand our perspective and know that we are right. But I think that right plus root equals wrong. Let me read from an article in Christianity Today. Oh, let me give you the first point first. How's that? Oh, let me do this first. <laughs> let me back up a little bit. It's President's Day weekend, right? Let me quote a great president, Thomas Jefferson, the 16th president. And, and if you think that presidents have not always been controversial, know this. When Thomas Jefferson was elected president, it started a civil war, right? Always been conflict everywhere. Billy Joel says we didn't start the fire, right? Thomas Jefferson probably wrote that song, and Billy Joel got a hold of it. Thomas Jefferson said, in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. I want to hold on to this simple quote, and, and I want to talk about this grace that we all must learn of standing for the things that we must stand on and not compromising those. And at the same time, having a willingness to swim with the current on the other matters that are out there. Notice this verse from Romans uh, 4 and verse 13. Paul is saying in verse 1, accept each other whose, whose faith is weak without fighting with each other about debatable manners. And he said, matters, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Paul's introducing an interesting concept. St. Augustine called that the adiaphora, the debatable matters of theology the things that are not central to our faith, but that we can agree to disagree about. I just want you to know, you hear that phrase all the time. It sounds maybe a little dangerous. Are we trying to water down our faith? But I just want you to know it's biblical. The Apostle Paul started it. Am I right? He says, uh, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. What that means is biblically, there are things within the church, people who sincerely, genuinely love Jesus, who are thoughtful, mature, wonderful people, who disagree with you on one topic 180 degrees. Paul said that's the way it is. And in their case, again, it was eating meat that had been sacrificed or eating wine or not eating any of it because some of it might be contaminated spiritually in some people's hearts. Or the other issue was whether they worship on Saturday or Sunday. And he covers those in Romans 12 through 15. He's talking about specifically the disputable matters that divide us. Not the central matters that divide us. Those are important too, am I right? Not the central matters that divide us, but the disputable matters. So here's what I want to say about that. Do not pass judgment, Paul says, on disputable matters. Do not pass judgment on disputable matters. Let me read to you from an article from Christianity Today. A few years ago, there was a church in the United States that lost 15% of its membership over an issue regarding baseball caps. That's right. 15% of the people walked over baseball caps. This is what happened. A couple of high school athletes were late getting home on a Saturday night because their team had played in a tournament a number of miles away the next morning. When they got up to attend worship services, they didn't have time to take a shower. They put on their nice clothes, but because their hair was messy, they wore baseball caps. Before the worship service started, 
One of the boy's moms approached one of the pastors to explain the situation. The pastor shrugged it off, saying no problem. So the boys wore their baseball caps during the service. Nobody complained. Here's where things got messy, though. The next Sunday, even though the boys had plenty of time to shower and get ready, they still wore their baseball cap. You could see that coming, right? And they wore them again the Sunday after that. About the fourth Sunday, some people were starting to get a little bit upset. To make a long story short, the elders of this church said the pastor told the pastor that he needed to fix the situation because people were pretty worked up about it. The pastor was back and forth on the issue thinking, these guys have a right to wear baseball caps if they want to. It's not a big deal because there's nothing in the Bible that says they shouldn't. But the more they thought about it, the more he knew it was going to be a big issue. He went to the boys and asked them to consider not wearing their hats to services. They agreed. However, when the boys' parents found out about this, it's always the baseball parents that are the problem. Am I right? They were very upset. The whole thing snowballed just like that. 15% of the members of this church left over an issue concerning baseball caps. This issue was particularly difficult for the pastor because he searched scripture. There was nothing there that talks about whether or not you can wear a cap, a baseball cap, to a worship service. He knew about the passage in 1 Corinthians about head coverings, but that was particular to Paul's day. And I think the pastor's right because... If we apply that, we know it says men shouldn't wear their head covered in worship, but it also says women must wear their head covered in worship. If you don't insist on one, you don't insist on the other, right? I mean, it's certainly a cultural issue. We understood the offense culturally to be in public. Well, anyway, there didn't seem to be anything in the Bible that said, you shall not wear baseball caps, or you shall not judge those who do wear baseball caps (laughs) when you worship, and on and on and on it goes. This is within our human nature, is it not? To somehow, as apparently the Roman Christians were doing 2,000 years ago, to lose sight of the bigger issues. Now, for some of you, I realize if it was a Red Sox cap, that that might be more controversy, am I right? (laughs) Here's what Paul's saying. Don't pass judgment on, on disputable matters. Two, be sensitive to the limits of others. Some people have different limits than you do. And, and Paul's saying, don't just be concerned about your limits, your spiritual limits. Be concerned about the limits of others. Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Do you know that Paul's actually quoting Leviticus when he talks about that? Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I'm the Lord. Isn't that interesting? How cruel would it be to curse someone, to say out loud a curse to them who's deaf because they can't hear you. You're making fun of them. How cruel would it be, Leviticus says, to put an obstacle in front of someone who can't see the obstacle and therefore would be derailed and tripped up. What Paul's inviting these particularly Jewish background and Gentile background Christians who are trying to get along and figure out what does it mean to be a Christian, what issues are central, what issues are disputable matters, and how do we get along with those things? As he's talking to them, he's saying, be careful that other people have limits that you don't have. He doesn't say, this is the way it's going to have to be on Saturday, Sunday, and, and the other matters. He just says, be loving toward each other in the way you deal with this issue. Leviticus says, don't, don't curse a deaf person or put a stumbling block in front of someone. Spiritually, though we certainly wouldn't do it to be cruel, that's what we're doing sometimes. If someone else is offended by the way we exercise our freedoms, they may be prevented from moving forward in their faith. I'm going to say more about that in a minute. Be sensitive to the value of others. What Paul's saying is, is do everything you can to build each other up. And the church is a family. The church is a body. We need the hands, we need the eyes, we need the ears. 
God makes us all different on purpose to function together. And if people who are very different can somehow function together, we don't all have the same um, vision on things. We don't all see the same things. Our, our heart doesn't necessarily jump at, at the same issues. And God makes us different from each other. If we can figure out how to function together on these disputable matters, again, I'm not talking about indisputable matters, I'm talking about disputable matters that divide us, then we can build each other up. We can glorify God by being united in the way we work together. Be sensitive that everyone is valued and do everything possible. I love that emphasis. And it seems a good conclusion to talking through these issues of forgiving each other, these issues of learning how to apologize, these issues of of learning even in love how to confront one another that we've been talking about for weeks. The bottom line is love. The higher standard of love is what can you do, not what can you get away with doing or not doing. It's not about what makes me comfortable in the body of Christ. It's about building someone else up in their faith. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Amen? That's that's the goal that Paul wants for all of us. 2,000 years ago, and I sort of expect today as well, don't you? Paul is saying this. Some issues simply do not matter. Some personality types like conflict. Is that fair to say? I don't know why, but some just seem to be more comfortable engaging, you know, on the spiritual gifts level. Um, These people would be more likely to be prophets. Prophets really don't care too much if they're popular. They just want to make sure they're right. And there's something really admirable about that. The problem can be on this other side, with every strength there's a weakness, is that we may forget what the bigger picture is, and we may forget that there are such things as disputable matters among us. And Paul's calling them to be careful about that. He really is talking about a value thing here. Weigh the consequences. Be wise in the way you approach subjects with one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. I've mentioned that conflict is an opportunity to glorify God. Marriage is an opportunity to glorify God. Be careful that you value relationships alongside being right. Are you with me? And, and, and I can't say that that's a science. I can't give you a legalistic formula for how to do that. I love the Friends tradition, the Quakers, because I feel like all along Quakers have been so careful not to be legalistic in terms of these things, but to always follow Christ. I do know from our history it's gotten us into trouble more than once. <laughs> but I'm so thankful to be part of a church family that that is seeking the mind of Christ and studying scripture and willing to stand on things that can be really unpopular and willing to disagree with each other well about other things that divide. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. So what I'm inviting you to do is to practice discernment and to be careful about that. What issues am I called to speak to with regard to truth? And how am I called to speak to those things in a relationship? Am I called to overlook on the side of flight on something? Am I called to confront on the side of fight for something else from last week's message? That's an art. That's something that you need to surround yourself with people who are really good at conflict, who can pray with you and talk with you through these things. Let's talk for a minute about taking a stand before I wind all this up. I'm not saying don't have convictions. Amen? I mean, keep reading Paul's letters. (laughs) He he, He is willing for there to be division over central issues. And as you study the pages of Scripture, you see what those are. And many of those are issues that our society would say, wow, that's really judgmental. Paul is not saying don't take a stand. 
He's saying be willing to take a stand, right? In fact, when I, when I introduce this whole thing with Romans 12 and then to 14, it's about love. But love must be sincere. It, it's not about hiding truth. Confronting someone can be a wonderfully loving thing to do, right? Uh, uh, parenting as an example. We don't do our kids any favors if we're not willing somehow to show them right from wrong, even though emotionally that can be really difficult. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, he says. Cling to what is good. Now, with regard to taking a stand, never compromise on essential matters. And I'm not spending a lot of time on that point because I think it's pretty self-evident by, by the idea that it's an essential matter. And Paul, in these chapters, also doesn't spend a lot of time on it with regard to the issue that the Roman Christians are facing in their church because that doesn't seem to be the thing that's dividing them. Isn't that interesting? Those things are more important, but that's not really what's dividing them. What's dividing them are the disputable matters. I want to invite you to write this down as kind of a, well, a concluding thought about learning the grace of when to swim with the current and when to stand like a rock. I am responsible to others. I'm not responsible for others. I think this is so important. We are not called to change someone else. Ultimately, the scripture in Romans is so plain. You will stand before God's judgment seat by yourself. As your pastor, I won't be the person standing there with you pleading your case. Won't be me. So I'm responsible to you. I'm responsible to love you as a church. I'm responsible to tell you what I discern to be truth I'm responsible to do that with gentleness and sincerity. I'm called to do everything I can to be a peacemaker in the, in the best sense of the word. To hate what's evil and to cling to what's good and all those things. I'm responsible to my wife in this sense as well. I'm responsible to disagree in a way that is loving with her when we disagree. To, to be willing to put to words, not to be aggressive, but, but to, to be, um, oh, Sermon Digest group knows the word I'm looking for. We had a great conversation about this. There's a difference between being aggressive and being not confrontive. Well, we'll talk about it Monday night. Join us at 7 o'clock. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk about it Monday night, and I'll get my words straight. But I'm responsible to her to put things into words and not to hang on to them in an unhealthy way and not to be a martyr in my relationship and not to be some of those categories we talked about, passive-aggressive. I'm called to, to share. It's just going to bother me until I come up with it, but I won't. I'm called to share with her what my thoughts are, my wants, my feelings, my needs. I'm not, not called to hide those things from her. Intimacy is about honesty. Love is about honesty. And at the same time, I want to value my relationship with her above my need to be understood, above my need to be right. I need to learn how to lay down my rights with her, with you, with others. I'm responsible too, but ultimately I'm not responsible for. I'm not called to change her. Did you get it? Assertive, Assertive thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the online help. <laughs> Being assertive gets a bad rap, but it's such an important thing. It's an ability to put into words, not to be aggressive, but to be assertive. Great difference. Really good conversation last Monday. If you want to join us Monday night, text me, and I'll give you a Zoom link. I'm responsible to, but I'm not responsible for. Swimmer stand. Just one more interesting note. As I've counseled with couples who are in conflict, particularly, I end up hearing stories, and it usually goes something like this. Well, he doesn't listen to me, doesn't ask, doesn't initiate conversation, doesn't plan dates, doesn't this, that, the other thing. 
he says, in a rather provoked fashion, she doesn't respect me. She speaks negatively about me in front of other people. She doesn't appreciate what I do. And simply on and on and on down the list. And often they're in the crazy cycle of, well, this is her fault and this is his fault and this is her fault and this is his fault. And essentially what they know what they need to do. Somebody needs to stop the dance. Somebody needs to agitate the cycle. Somebody needs to be different. Somebody needs to be Jesus in the marriage, right? <laughs> Somebody needs to initiate love that's undeserved. And so I tell them, you know, the Bible says that it's clear which one of you is supposed to initiate the kindness undeserved. Do you know who that is? And often they'll say the husband. No, that's not the biblical answer. The answer is the one in the relationship who considers himself most mature. That's the one in the conflict. The one who considers himself to be most mature is the one who is called to initiate love, to take the risk of being giving and serving or listening or to take that first step even if you feel disrespected or to take the step of showing respect even if you feel unloved. Someone is called to do that in every relationship with the disagreements we find ourselves in, not just in marriage, but in any realm of church life or families or offices. Someone is called to put to practice all of these good words Paul's offering. All of the good words that scripture teaches us about conflict. Someone is called to be the peacemaker. Someone is called to be like Christ when they don't feel like it, when they're afraid of being misunderstood, when they're hurt, when they want to react. They're called to respond the way Jesus would and to initiate care and to initiate love. Who is that? <laughs> it's the one who considers themselves most mature. Paul says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Are you the strong one or are you the weak one? Well, the weak are those who insist and focus on disputable matters. Isn't that interesting? The weak in this case are the ones who say, you can't eat meat. You can't do it. It might be polluted. Paul's identifying them as weak. Read through the whole thing. You'll see that really, really plainly. But you who are strong, he says, ought to bear with the failings of the weak. You ought to be the one who initiates kindness to them because they need it for, your, for their sake, not for your sake. You're the one called to limit your freedom. You're the one called to be the peace initiator in the relationship. The weak or the strong. It's not that the weak don't have a strong commitment. They're very committed to the issues they're committed to. Have you noticed? They're passionate. You can't eat meat. You can't wear baseball caps. They're very strong and very passionate about it. It means something to them emotionally, and you can tell. It's not that they don't care by saying they're weak. They're very strong about their convictions. But their faith does not give them the same freedom that the strong, in this case, that Paul identifies, gives to them. Isn't that interesting? I read a little story several months ago because I felt like our country was divided and I was noticing social media posts that were so uncomfortable. So I read a little story. This was back in July. I'm going to reread it. <laughs> Boy, maybe now more than ever, the church needs to shine in terms of our witnessing conflict. Amen. It's a very simple little story. It was quoted by Martin Luther. It goes all the way back to an Aesop's fable, actually. But it was quoted by Martin Luther around the table with some of his um, disciples. And I think it says so much about our need to reevaluate our arguments <laughs> with each other. Uh, it's labeled two goats on a bridge. And I'm going to pause after this. Let us sit and reflect in open worship. 
and consider how the Lord may be speaking to us about any one of our conflicts. If you're called during open worship to speak, please find the microphone if you're in the fellowship hall or if you're here or write in the comments online. When two goats meet upon a narrow bridge over deep water, how do they behave? Neither of them can turn back again. Neither can pass the other because the bridge is too narrow. If they should fight with one another, they might both fall into the water and be drowned. Nature then has taught them that if the one lays himself down and permits the other to go over him, both remain unhurt. And this was added. Even so, people should rather endure to be trod upon than to fall into debate and discord with one another. Let's attend to the presence of Christ. Invite him to speak to our hearts in the silence.